Introduction The Battle of Gallipoli took place at Gallipoli Peninsula in Turkey from the 25th of April 1915 to the 9th of January 1916. A joint British and French operation was mounted to capture the Ottoman capital of Constantinople, Istanbul, and secure sea route to Russia. The attempt failed, with heavy casualties on both sides. In Turkey, the campaign is known as the Shinakkala Save Slavic, after the province of Shinakkala. In the UK, it is called the Dardanelles Campaign or Gallipoli. In France it is called Les Dardanelles. In Australia, New Zealand, and Newfoundland, it is known as the Gallipoli Campaign or simply as Gallipoli. The Gallipoli Campaign resonated profoundly among all nations involved. In Turkey, the battle is perceived as a defining moment in the history of the Turkish people. A final surge in the defense of the motherland as the centuries-old Ottoman Empire was divided by vultures. Along the Lampadis, the struggle laid the grounds for the Turkish War of Independence and the foundation of the Turkish Republic eight years later by Ataturk, himself a commander at Gallipoli. The Allies wanted to open an effective supply route to Russia. Efforts on the Eastern Front relieved pressure on the Western Front. The Baltic Sea was blocked by Germany's formidable Kaiserish Marine. The Black Sea's only entrance was to the Bosporus, which was controlled by the Ottoman Empire. When the Ottoman Empire joined the Central Powers in October 1914, Russia could no longer be supplied from the Mediterranean Sea. A first proposal to attack Turkey had already been suggested by French Minister of Justice Aristide Briand in November 1914, but it was not supported. A suggestion by British Naval Intelligence, Room 39, to bribe the Turks over to the Allied side was not taken up. Later in November, First Lord of the Admiralty Winston Churchill put forward his first plans for a naval attack on the Dardanelles, based at least in part on what turned out to be erroneous reports regarding Turkish troop strength. He reasoned that the Royal Navy had a large number of obsolete battleships which could not be used against the German high seas fleet in the North Sea, but which might well be made useful in another theater. Initially, the attack was to be made by the Royal Navy alone with only token forces from the army being required for routine occupation tasks. Naval attacks on the 19th of February. The first attack on the Dardanelles began when a strong Anglo-French task force, including the British battleship HMS Queen Elizabeth, bombarded British artillery along the coast. Many believed victory to be inevitable. A sense of impending victory was heightened by the interception of a German wireless message which revealed the Ottoman Dardanelle force were close to running out of ammunition. On the 18th of March the main attack was launched. The fleet, comprising 18 battleships as well as an array of cruise gun destroyers, saw the fact that the near boldest point of the Dardanelles were the straits are just a mile wide. Despite some damage sustained by ships in the Ottoman forts, Mine sweepers were ordered to proceed along the strait. There were battles seven years after the first flight of the airplane. In 1970, the idea of military airplanes came into being. Ottoman Minister of War, Mahmoud the Pasha closely followed the development of airplanes and in 1911, he formed the Department of Military Aviation. This department served as the basis of the modern Turkish Air Force. The Navy four types he claimed used by Captain Sidney, First Lieutenant Fissel and First Lieutenant Simmel from its disposition in Kanakiyamara Square, observed the activity of British and French ships. The report of Turkish pilots on the 18th of March 1915 is as follows. In front of Ireland even those 40 enemy ships were seen. 19 of them are heavy, 3 of them are light cruisers. The others are steamers and aircraft carriers. Submarines were seen as well, but the number is uncertain. Six English dreadnoughts were noticed. They are advancing in assault order and the French ships are weighing anchors. The French ship Uvade exploded in mysterious circumstances, causing it to capsize with its entire crew aboard. Minesweepers, manned by civilians and under constant fire of Ottoman shells, retreated leaving the minefield largely intact. Some of the sunk battleships the British naval artillery advantage was diminished following the torpedoing of the battleship HMS Goliath on the 13th of May by Turkish torpedo boat Mervin at Imeraidi. Shortly after German submarine SMU, 
21 sank HMS Triumph on the 25th of May and HMS Majestic on the 27th of May. Following these losses, much of the battleship support was withdrawn and those remaining would fire while underway, reducing their accuracy and effectiveness. HMS Irresistible and HMS Inflexible both sustained critical damage from mines, although there was confusion during the battle whether torpedoes were to blame. HMS Ocean, sent to rescue the Irresistible, was itself struck by an explosion and both ships eventually sunk. The French battleships Southern and Bengalwa were also badly damaged. All the ships had sailed through a new line of mines placed secretly by the news mine mineship ten days before. The losses prompted the Allies to cease any further attempts to force the Straits by naval power alone. Losses had been anticipated during the planning of the campaign, so mainly obsolete battleships had been sent which were unfit to face the German fleet, but many naval officers including de Robach and Fischer did not consider the losses acceptable. Land invasion after the failure of the naval attacks. It was decided that ground forces were necessary to eliminate the Turkish mobile artillery. This would allow minesweepers to clear the waters for the larger vessels. The British Secretary of State for World War Kitchener appointed General Sir Ian Hamilton to command the Mediterranean Expeditionary Force that was to carry out the mission. In early 1915, General Hamilton had Anzac also had the regular British 29th Division. The Royal Naval Division and the French Oriental Expeditionary Corps under his command. There was a delay of over six weeks before many of the troops arrived from Britain, allowing Turkish forces time to prepare for a land assault. Ottoman commanders began to debate the best means of defending the peninsula. All agreed that the most effective form of defense was to hold the high ground on the ridges of peninsula. There was disagreement however as to where they believed the enemy would land and hence where to concentrate their forces. Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, a 34-year-old lieutenant Kumo, familiar with the Gallipoli Peninsula from his operations against Bulgaria in the Balkan War, believed Cape Hells, the southern tip of the peninsula, and Gabatit would be the two most likely areas for landing. In the case of the former, Kemal Ataturk, perceived the British would use their navy to command the land from every side which the tip of the peninsula would allow. In Gabatip, the short distance to the eastern coast meant forces could easily reach the Narrows. Ultimately, Bottlewin and von Sanders disagreed. In his view, the greatest danger posed was in the Sika Bay on the Asiatic coast, where Sanders believed British forces would benefit from more accessible terrain and target the most important Ottoman batteries guarding the Straits. As such, Sanders placed two divisions, a third of the total force of the 5th Army. In this area. Two more divisions were concentrated at Bulao at the northern isthmus of the peninsula, where he believed that should the area be captured, vital supply and communications lines would be cut. Finally, at Cape Hells, on the tip of the peninsula, and along the Aegean coast, two more divisions were placed in the form of the 9th and 19th Division, the latter of which was placed in command of Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. For von Sanders, the bulk of the forces were to be held in one with minor coastal defenses spread across the peninsula. The strategy drew complaints from Turkish commanders, including Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, who believed Turkish forces were too widely dispersed and not in a position to drive the attackers immediately into the sea as soon as their invasion commenced. The delay in landings by the British allowed Turkish officers to prepare defenses. Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, whose 19th Division would become pivotal in the battle, observed the beaches and awaited signs of an invasion from his post at Agali, near Meadows, his thought, invasion plan. The invasion plan of the 25th of April 1915 was for the 29th Division to land at Hells on the tip of the peninsula and then advance upon the fort at Kiel with the Heer. The Anzacs were to land north of Gabatip on the Aegean coast from where they could advance across the peninsula and prevent retreat from more reinforcement of Kiel at Bahia. The small cove around and in which they landed became known as Anzac Cove. The area held by the British and French became known as the Hells. Cape Hells Landing Beaches. The Hells Landing was made by the 29th Division under the command of Major General Elmer Hunter Weston. On five beaches in a knock about the tip of the peninsula, designated from east to west as S, V, W, X and Y Beach. 
the commander of the Royal Beach Landing was able to walk in a post to within 500 meters of Krithia village, which was deserted. The British never got so close again. Royal Beach was eventually evacuated the following day as Turkish reinforcements arrived. The main landings were made at Gig Beach, beneath the old settled Bahia Fortress, and at W Beach, a short distance to the west on the other side of the Hell's Headland. At Gig Beach, the covering force from the Royal Munster Fusiliers and Royal Hampshires was landed from a converted collier, SS River Clyde which was run aground beneath the fortress so that the troops could disembark directly via ramps to the shore. The Royal Dublin Fusiliers would land at V Beach from open boats. At W Beach the Lancashire Fusiliers also landed in open boats on a small beach overlooked by dunes and obstructed with barbed wire. On both beaches the Turkish defenders were in a position to inflict appalling casualties on the landing infantry. The troops emerging one by one from the Sally ports on the river Clyde presented perfect targets to the machine guns in the settled Bahia fort. Out of the first 200 soldiers to defend Bob, only 21 men could make it onto the beach. Getting back, the Turkish defenders were too few to force the British off the beach. At W Beach, thereafter known as Lancashire Landing, the Lancashires were able to overwhelm the defenses despite their dreadful losses. 600 killed or wounded out of a total strength of 1,000. The battalions that landed at V Beach suffered about 70% casualties. Only one Dublin officer survived the landing. Overall, of the 1,012 Dubliners who landed, only 11 would survive the entire Jarrah campaign.